Hello and welcome back. This is Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today's tabletop review in comparison is the Smith & Wesson number 3 Schofield Revolver and the Colt Single Action Army model of 1873. Now these are all representations made by Uberti and sold and marketed by Cimarron in Texas here in the United States. Uh, we're going to start off with an historical overview showing exactly where these two have their uh, place in history and where they cross paths, uh, as well as their reference points and pop culture. And then we will talk about the Uberti offerings specifically. If that sounds interesting to you, please stick around. That's coming up now. All right, so the story really does begin with the Smith & Wesson Model 3 Top Break Revolver. Now, originally it wasn't named the Schofield, and we'll get into that. So. What essentially happened is, is this really all starts at the end of the Civil War. And this point in history, in the uh, uh, 19, kind of the, the mid to late uh, 1860s, and I know I'm going to say 19 a lot, uh, it's just forced to happen. I'm usually used to talking about World War II guns and stuff like that. So in the 1860s, Civil War ends. And what that creates is a massive drop in demand for firearms in the United States. Now keep in mind, during the Civil War, uh, the firearms industry in terms of you know production for ordnance, factories, and for the military was a little bit different. So uh, especially in the, in the South so with the Confederate military, you have a lot of people procuring their own firearms, which means individuals are going into the local gun shops, buying their rifles and handguns, and then taking those to war. Uh, now you also had government or state issued uh, firearms on both the North and the South, and then also what would happen at the end of the war is those firearms were usually taken home by the individuals. Now, during that period of time, we didn't have a lot of big commercialism and capitalism in terms of, you know, collecting and firearms and other things like we would today with guns and cars and jewelry and that sort of thing. So typically it was very utilitarian. It was a standard household would usually have some sort of a shotgun, a rifle, and maybe a handgun. Uh, for more practical purposes, whether it's defense or for uh, hunting and that sort of thing. So you didn't have people going out buying 10 or 15 rifles like you do today. So when there is a little bit of a drop in demand kind of in the bucket of gun sales, there is it's really felt across all the industry and all the manufacturers. So at that time, the late 60s, Smith & Wesson was only reporting, the entire company was reporting a sales of about 15 units per month which is incredibly slow. I mean, if any gun store today were selling that few guns, they probably wouldn't be around very long, and this is a manufacturer. Now, granted, Smith & Wesson as a company hadn't been around for that long during that period of time. So it really created, and this is across all manufacturers, it created a need for innovation. So self-contained uh, firearms, especially in handguns, were a very new concept at that time. And this would really pave the way for things like the Schofields or the Smith & Wesson number threes and the single action armies. Now, Smith & Wesson did have a patent on the board through revolver cylinder, and that was known as the Roland White Patent of 1855. So what this patent allowed Smith & Wesson to do is they had the board through cylinder for self-contained cartridges. It didn't include board through uh, cylinders for cap and ball or, or black powder percussion revolvers, which Colt did have at that time, which was currently in use with the military, which was the Colt Model 1860 percussion revolver. So anyway, keep that patent in mind because that'll come in play in the single action army history. So with decreasing demand in the United States for, for, uh, for handguns or for really any firearms at all, and keep in mind Smith was really primarily a handgun manufacturer, they had to go to other markets. So Smith & Wesson designed a series of top break self-contained cartridge revolvers, which they would put together for an exhibition. I believe it was in Paris. It was in France. I think it was in Paris though in the late 1860s. So at this exhibition, the revolvers do gain the attention of Archduke Alexis, who is the son of the Tsar in Russia. Now, he is captivated with these top break, bored through cylinder, self-contained cartridge revolvers that are being exhibited by Smith & Wesson. And he talks to Smith & Wesson about plans to develop a new revolver that will be used for the Russian military. 
Now this takes place in 1869. There is a redesign of a larger frame, and this is the frame number three. So at the time, Smith & Wesson, like today we have N frames and K frames and L frames and, and that sort of thing. But at that time, uh, of course, three was the, was the model designation for large frames. So we had the number three revolver, which was first uh, manufactured to fulfill the needs for the Russian military contracts. Now, when this is completed, Smith & Wesson sends two of these revolvers uh, out, one to Russia and one to the United States Military Ordnance Department. And upon receipt in Russia of the new number three revolver, uh, Russia orders 20,000 units. So after those 20,000 units are built and then sent in, uh, or built and then shipped to Russia for their testing and use, uh, the feedback was excellent, but there were a couple changes that they wanted to make, which were which came through in what was known the second model Russian, which was a change to the grips and a change to the barrel length. Now these original uh, revolvers were cham chambered in 44 Russian, and the version that was sent for testing for the mil military ordnance was in 44 American. So what would happen is Grand Duke Alexis would come to the United States and he would tour the Smith & Wesson factory and go on a big hunting expedition with his number three Smith & Wesson revolver. Buffalo Bill, who we all know as a famous kind of an old Western character, was going to go on that expedition with him. And they turned it into a big extravaganza, a big show where they had Indians doing uh, archery uh, stunts and riding horses and all these spectators came out to, to view this big spectacle and that actually would end up turning into Buffalo Bill's Western show. Anyway, on that trip, Grand Duke Alexis did end up shooting a running buffalo with his uh, number three revolver and, and he was so impressed and happy with everything the way that they were going so he ordered 100,000 more units. Now this would lead Smith & Wesson into some hot water because they began production on these 100,000 units for Russia. But in the meantime, the Russians are back in Russia doing their Russian things and trying to find cheaper alternatives to the manufacture of this revolver. So what they do is they take some of their original number three revolvers and they send them out to, well, first Tula in Russia, Germany, Webley and Scott in, uh, in England to see who can manufacture a copy of this revolver but can do it much, uh, much more cost effective or much cheaper. So... Uh, different prototypes and, and production models are made and sent to Russia and they're viewed as every bit as reliable and durable but at a substantially lower price. So what does that do? Well Russia decides to can the order with Smith & Wesson even though they're well into production for these 100,000 units and they delay and stop payment on, on a lot of the units that they've already been shipped and received. So for a small company and, and their first large Ameri or their large military contract, this hurts Smith & Wesson financially big time and they're in a lot of trouble. Luckily for them in 1870, the US Army does adopt the Model 3 themselves and the caliber of 44 Smith & Wesson American. Now this will stay in service uh, from 1970 to 1975, and this also does make it the first self-contained cartridge revolver to be issued to any American service or any branch of the American military ever in history. So keep in mind, we're now in 1970. These are being uh, ramped up in production for the American military. They're also being sold on the commercial market. And this is really the first revolver you find on the frontier. So 1970 to 1973, this was it, other than percussion revolvers. If you want a self-contained large frame revolver, uh, this is it. This is your option. This was also a replacement for the model 1860 Colt percussion revolver. So in 1975, Major George Schofield makes recommendations to the Ordnance Department on things that can be improved on this revolver. The number one thing he changed is a frame mounted latch up here on the top to open up the top the, the brake. What this allowed individuals to do, especially cavalry, is with one hand on the reins and one hand on the revolver, when it's empty, of course you got to move it to half cock, which it is right now, you could rest this on your leg or your saddle or anything else that can grab that latch, move it open, with your other arm or your leg you can kick this back, you just heard that click, that would have just ejected all your casings manually. Then you stick this in your hand that's holding the reins, reach in your pocket, load all your cartridges, go ahead and snap it back. You can switch back to your dominant hand and then continue firing. So that was the major improvement made by Schofield, which was accepted. The Ordnance Department uh, requested the revision 
And then they went through for a second round of contracting for this revolver, mainly as a cavalry, uh, and I cavalry, say that word weird, uh, revolver, an option. And then the standard barrel length, of course, was seven inches, like we see here. The second thing that they wanted Smith & Wesson to do was to come out with the 45 Long Colt variant, which they didn't, they came out with the 45 Smith & Wesson. The 45 Smith & Wesson was a shorter cartridge, therefore the cylinder was shorter. It was actually the other way around. Because the cylinder was shorter, they could only house the 45 Smith & Wesson. Same diameter as the 45 Colt, obviously, but a little bit shorter. Now keep in mind, we're in 1975. Now, in 1973, we had started production of the Colt Single Action Army, which is the reason why they wanted to go to a 45 Long Colt, because that was the caliber of the 45 uh, sing Colt Single Action Army. So they could have a standardized one caliber uh, for both revolvers. So both of these were in service at that time. Uh, one, one caliber for both revolvers would be logistically excellent on the Ordnance Department. Because that could not be fulfilled, we had two calibers. It couldn't be done. Now. The Schofield cannot chamber the 45 Colt, it was too long, but the 45, uh, the single action army could chamber the shorter Smith & Wesson 45 cal cartridge. Now, despite the two cartridges, these would stay in service together um, until, of course, the, the first instance happens where you have a uh, isolated group of, of people shipped accidentally. 45 Long Colt, although they're all issued Schofield revolvers, and now you have a bunch of guys that don't have ammunition that'll work in their revolvers. So the Ordnance Department decided, well, this is this is way too much of a logistical nightmare. We're going to go ahead and dump the Schofield, uh, really for two reasons. One is soldiers tend to really like the single action army a little bit more, and the second reason one is, is the single action army could fire both cartridges, and at this time the Ordnance Department was loaded with 45 Smith & Wesson. So why not just go for the single revolver that can shoot both cartridges from that point forward? We will only make 45 long Colt and we won't have these logistical issues again. So that would phase out the Schofield revolver from service in favor of the Colt single action army. Now moving over into the Colt single action army and I'm going to back up in time just a little bit. So we have the 1855 Roland White patent which would not allow Colt to compete with a self-contained cartridge and a bore through cylinder. Now that patent did expire in, in, I'm sorry, in 1869. So in 1869, the expiration of the patent, Colt begins to get to work. They put William Mason and Charles Richards, which were Colt's two top tier uh, uh, gunsmiths or manufacturers at the time, innovators at the time, they put them on the project. So by 1872, they do have a child's production, tri child's, a child's production revolver in the seven and a half inch barrel, and that is course what we know today is the Colt Single Action Army. They wanted to meet this deadline because in uh, 1872 that's when the uh, Ordnance Department trials were going on for a new revolver. Now we know that in 1870 the Schofield was accepted or at that time it was the just the number three Smith & Wesson and then 1975 the Schofield. 1872 it goes to trials it is also accepted into service and production begins in 1873 as the Colt Single Action Army. The original caliber would be 45 Long Colt, which is what we talked about when we, when we were mentioning the Schofield. Together, the single action army and the Schofield would replace the model 1860 Colt percussion revolver, and now we have two standardized self-contained cartridge uh, handguns in the arsenal, being used standard issue by the military. Now, both of these revolvers would stay in service with the United States military until 1892 when they would be replaced by the Colt model 1892. Now the advantages of the 1892 is that it had a swing out cylinder and it was double and single action. Those were the two main. So it, reloads were a lot quicker. It was an overall much more durable design, easier to clean, easier to maintain, lighter to carry. So that's when we see the modernization moving into the 1900s of you know the revolvers we would see in service throughout the world uh, during that period of time. Now barrel lengths, the Schofield revolver was initially issued in a seven inch barrel. The Colt Single Action Army was originally issued in a seven and a half inch barrel known as the Cavalry model. You also had a five and a quarter inch barrel which was known as the Artillery model. These were the two military models. Then at that time you did have a four and three quarter inch barrel which was known as the Civilian or the Gunfighter model. These are not really issued in any significant numbers. Individuals may have bought them for military use, but this was really a civilian purpose gun very common amongst outlaws and you know what you know all the, the things you see in the movies due to the concealability overall. 
and the weight. But here's your two military model single action armies and your military model Schofield number three Smith revolver. Now, moving into these revolvers as made by Uberti. So your modern options. So first of all, if you do want to purchase an original Schofield in good mechanical condition, but most with you know most of the finish wearing off, you know you're going to pay in the three to five thousand dollar range. If I ever get one, which would be really nice, I will do a comparison between the original and the modern day uh, uh, remakes of the of the revolver, so you can kind of see what those changes are. Now some modern revisions were made on the this is a U Birdie. Schofield like the lengthening of the cylinder to accommodate a 45 Colt just due to uh, ammo availability things like that that you would not obviously have seen on the original strength up strengthened up the action a little bit uh, things like that but if I ever get an original with Schofield we'll go in detail about what changes were made there the Uberti version so Ubertis are made in Italy and they are imported by two major companies one is Cimarron which this one is a Cimarron import Uberti and one is Taylor I generally recommend the Cimarron imports. They do pay a lot more attention to detail. I know they have a person uh, stationed at the Uberti plant who actually personally inspects firearms before they are sent into the country. I don't know if that's myth or truth, but based on a lot of my reading, that tends to be truth. I've purchased in a lot of Cimarron products uh, made by Uberti, but of course imported through Cimarron, and their quality control does seem to be excellent. Now, Taylor's also does import Uberti products, and uh, but their co quality control, at least my reading on the internet and in my personal experience, is not as nice. This right here is an 1866 Yellow Boy, uh, made by Uberti and imported by Taylor. Uh, really, really nice gun, but I'm going to bring this in. You might be able to see, I'm sorry the lights are in the way, but there's like really bad cow spotting just like the coloration looks awful. Uh, down on this side, there are even little punch marks. Uh, you probably can't see that because you're getting a lot of reflection back at you. And if you hold this in the light and look at it, just around the, um, the, the screw holes and all of that, there's just little micro scratches all over it. Just I've ordered in a lot of Cimarron imported Uberti products and I've never seen that. I mean, all of their products look really top notch. This is my first from Taylor's and I'm gonna say I'm really disappointed. It just it looks used honestly and i am actually returning it now that could be a fluke and i just got a really bad apple and and you know so take that for what that is that is just one example uh, i'm not trying to bad mouth them but when i experience something like that i'll just share it and now one other point of note is the cimarron imported uberti schofield revolvers are offered in the original seven inch a five inch and a three and a half inch you can get them in 44 Winchester Centerfire, which actually was an original caliber offered in the Schofield. You can get them in 45 Colt, uh, 38 Special. Um, I believe that is it. I'll look that up and annotate that if I'm wrong. Now, the original Schofield was offered in 44 Russian, 44 Smith & Wesson American, 38 Smith & Wesson, 44 Henry, and then 44 40, like I just mentioned. So the only original caliber that the Schofield was offered in that you can get today is the 4440, and that's actually exactly what this is. Now these do retail in about the $1,100 range. Um, so they're not cheap, but they are just beautifully made, and I'll, I'll bring this in for some close-up details here in a second. Now the single action army is made by Uberti and imported by Cimarron, also beautifully made. Uh, you can get these in the seven and a half inch, uh, the five and a quarter, the four and three quarter inch barrels. I believe they might make other barrel links. I'll throw that up on the screen here. Uh, calibers as well, the 45 Colt, the 357, and, and as well as others. Now, the original caliber of the single action army was 45 Colt, 44 40, 38 40, 32 20, and 38 Colt. And of course, we went over the barrel lengths. Now, the Schofield revolver is heavier, it does weigh in at 2.9 pounds. And uh, the single action army in the seven and a half inch barrel does weigh in at 2.3 pounds. So this is about half a pound heavier, and this is even a half inch longer barrel. So you can you could just tell. And the difference is this just a really massive frame and a massive barrel as compared to the Colt. I mean, you can just look at the two and just say see that this you can see the weight physically in the gun. Now Cimarron does use a two piece walnut stock set here on the Schofield. They do have a really nice, just beautiful blue finish. It reminds me of the finish on like a Colt Python, just beautiful. Your small parts are color case hardened. Now the original color case hardening was a different process. You actually did use 
uh, heat and fire and that sort of thing to harden the parts. These are not, uh, this is just an ash, acid chemical uh, bath that's put on them. Now the cool thing is, is it just like original case color hardening, it does give you a unique signature on the uh, kind of the waves and the marbling texture that's different on every single gun. So no matter which one you get, that, that is going to look unique, which I think is personally really cool. Now the single action army copies here, you can get in different configurations. You can get in the Bisley models, you can get in stainless, you can get the color case hardened frames like you see here with the blued finish. You can get it in all blued. Um, go check out Cimarron's webpage and all the products that they offer there as well. So to finish it off with some pop culture references, the Schofield was used by Jesse James, Bob Ford, who is the one who killed Jesse James, uh, John Wesley Harden, Pat Garrett, Theodore Roosevelt, Billy the Kid, and of course Charlie Prince. Uh, Charlie Prince was ob obviously not a real person. I think personally he's modeled after Billy the Kid, but if you have not seen 310 to Yuma, go check that out. That is an awesome movie where you will see the Schofield revolvers uh, basically uh, personified. And that movie is, that is what Charlie Prince uses. He uses two of them in this exact configuration with the blued finish, seven inch barrel. Uh, of course, we don't know what caliber they're in. Probably 4440 would be my guess. Also in 310 to Yuma, which is of course the most modern uh, Western classic, you do see the single action army is used by Russell Crowe's character, whose name is uh, Ben Wade in the movie. They call it the Hand of God, which coincidentally, uh, Cimarron does offer a version of that. It's a copy of that gun with the uh, silver cross and lays on the grip and that sort of stuff. If you're into that kind of stuff, it's cool, go check it out. Uh, single action armies usually is your quintessential Western gun. In all your old Western movies, it's the single action armies you're typically seeing. And you're typically seeing them in the four and three quarter inch barrel. They just look better on screen. And I believe that is the same barrel length that is used by uh, Ben Wade and 310 to Yuma as well. And to finish it off, I'm here to take a look. Here is of course the Schofield 4440. Set it on half cock can open up the, the latch. This is really what makes it a Schofield. There's your ejector. Close it up. Really, really nice. Single action only, of course, with a really, really light trigger. Of course, you see that really big hammer-mounted firing pin. Looks really evil. And you have the cool ordnance, the fake ordnance markings here on the grips. But very nice. There's the top. Your side is here on the latch front sight here, half moon, front sight, seven inch barrel, just a beautiful firearm. Single action army, seven and a half inch barrel. Now keep in mind to load and unload, you have to bring this to half cock, open up the loading gate, and then you can load in your rounds one at a time, just like that. When you're done, you will have to bring it to half cock again, open up the loading gate and use your ejector here to knock those out, turn it, ejector knocks out the round, so on and so forth. So as you can see, the Schofield was a lot easier to load and unload. But these were a lot more comfortable, easy to aim, shoot, lighter, uh, just overall. Other than the reloading uh, portion, it was really deemed to be just a better gun. But to each his own, they're both beautiful and they're both excellent pieces of history. And I'm glad we had him here to do a video for you. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. If you enjoyed that, please let me know by hitting that like button. If you have any questions, please leave those down in the comment section. If you want to see more content on the old Western style firearms, I do have videos coming up featuring lever guns, stagecoach guns, uh, more videos on handguns. So we'll do that and we'll have those coming up. Please stay tuned. Please subscribe to our channel. Thank you guys so much for stopping by. This is Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. We will see you next time.